humans! Today we will discuss manganese and also a selection of completely random topics as and when they pop into my head. Manganese is a transition metal that has many fine qualities. It is shiny and brittle and is crucial in steel production as a deoxidizer. Additionally, high manganese metal alloys are exceptionally hard. Manganese dioxide is a pigment used since the beginning of humanity. Literally. Like, it is heavily featured in cave paintings at Gargas. In the Middle Ages, it was used to cancel out the green tint from blown glass caused by iron impurities. Add enough of it and the glass would turn pink. Either way, color was being influenced in glassmaking. And still is. <laughs> Moving on. One of manganese's chief features, and a thing that sets it apart from all other transition metals, is its ability to deoxidize things. Many of its uses boil down to, if there is oxygen around, manganese will take it away. I had already decided that this column, consisting of manganese, technetium, rhenium, and borium, were going to be hobbits. I've always wanted an excuse to paint hobbits. One of my favorite artists and a good con buddy is Chaz Kemp, and my favorite of his pieces is a hobbit. He had it printed on metal, it was hanging in the art show at Starfest, and I loved it so much. He does postmodern steampunk nouveau, all digital. I'll link his website because he is awesome. Funny story. I had been a fan of his work for years, but never met him. And at this one convention, my buddy Dakota and I joined a small discussion room. There were about a dozen people just sitting around a table, chit-chatting. It was an official event, but it seemed so chill. And we joined in and just discussed books and media. And what dessert would you choose if you could only eat one for the rest of your life? For two hours. <laughs> And when everyone was like, well, that was fun, I laughingly pointed out that we hadn't even introduced ourselves. And when he held out his hand and said, Chaz Kemp, I nearly flipped a biscuit. One of my favorite artists, an opportunity to pick his brain about the craft, and we talked about pie. <laughs> As I recall, though, it was his life mate Carolyn who said ice cream. My memory is hazy, but she did point out that ice cream has endless flavors and it would never get boring. Very sensible woman. Good writer, too. I'll link her books. At any rate, manganese does not just corral oxygen in industrial settings. It is a biological nutrient as well, and for much the same reasons, because while it does aid in bone growth and macronutrient metabolism, it also helps defend against free radicals, i.e. oxygen getting into places it shouldn't. Granted, an overdose of manganese will start to rob oxygen from organs that need it, but a balance is not hard to maintain. It has the same role and the same threat in soil and even in marine life, and this remarkable consistency is why I have declared his handle gathering and am painting him with this basket of alpine blue butterflies he is collecting. Those who are paying attention might remember that the character of oxygen is shown with alpine blue butterfly wings to signify his ubiquity and gregariousness. And if any lepidopterist wants to correct me in the comments about the gregariousness of alpine blues, I am so down for that conversation. Bring it on. I want to learn. It was tricky to paint a basket that would look like it could contain butterflies without totally obscuring them. Let me know in the comments if I succeeded. I may fret about it forever regardless, but fortunately, I am distractible. For instance, I have Annie Lennox singing Walking on Broken Glass stuck in my head because someone in my feed posted the video the other day and I hadn't seen it since I was a kid and I was like, what the fuck is that John Malkovich? Is that a Hugh fucking Laurie? Oh my gods, this is priceless. Jason and I used to watch House, but that was not how I was introduced to Hugh Laurie, no. First, in high school, I got to know his voice because one of my besties, Claire, who was a transplant from Australia, was also a big old Blackadder fan, but only the audio. And she made me cassette tapes of the radio play versions, which were a lot like podcasts, come to think of it, because entertainment has come full circle. And I loved those tapes. It was just Blackadder the second and third, mind you. To this day, I prefer to just listen to those seasons because, frankly, my imagination has better cinematography than the showrunners. Like, for example, when Edmund is pounding on Baldrick a few minutes before Baldrick brings out his dream turnip, I, naturally, always assumed that the pounding is what broke the turnip. It's funnier that way. Also, the fat prince jokes are funnier if you can picture a fat prince. I know it was supposed to be ironic, but meh. 
after we moved in the mid-90s and befriended Kit and Corey, of whom I have spoken before, they introduced us to their parents' quixotic approach to media, which was to ignore anything they didn't like and collect the rest. This is how those kids in 1997 had never seen a Bugs Bunny cartoon, never heard of Johnny Depp or Gina Davis, but had VHS tapes of The Avengers and The Prisoner and Mission Impossible and Jeeves and Wooster. Heather and I would go do sleepovers and marathon these awesome old shows, and of course we were immediately hooked. So when I see Hugh Laurie in anything, my first thought is always, Birdie! And I don't care who knows it. And yes, our first hobbit is a redhead. I needed him to pop against all that turquoise. For the longest time, he was my mental Sam Vimes, too, but he has aged beyond that role now, and these days I picture David Tennant. They have not yet done Vimes right on screen. I hope they manage it some day. Last week was Terry Pratchett's death anniversary. It's been six years. Imagine the thirteen books he would have written if he'd been given those years. It's a greedy thought, but what can I say? Fandom is kind of greedy. Does any creator want their tribe one day to be like, You can stop making stuff now. We're full. <laughs> I don't think so. I think he'd like to know we still miss him. That he still makes us think. <sighs> GNU, Sir Terry. Man is not dead. You know the rest. Let's get those feet looking furry. With all the many, many things I love about the Lord of the Rings movies, I do think the fur on the feet was too scanty. It didn't look like it could keep them warm, which is, I think, the reason it was there in the first place. Tolkien wanted a permanently barefooted race, and so he approached it logically by adding leathery soles and fur to keep the cold away. I don't know, though. Maybe it would have looked weird on screen, like Austin Powers' chest rug. <laughs> oh well. Regardless, it's good and thick here, and my head cannon is thus represented. This basket is decorated with a rhodochrosite crystal cluster, one of manganese's more well-known minerals. So red and shiny. I have long said, while we're on the subject, that since the hobbits are never mentioned in the Silmarillion and have some mystery in their origin story, it is fun to speculate. My personal theory is that when the Entwives disappeared, they went west and ended up founding the Shire, but then they missed having Entings to share it all with and teach it to, so Yavanna interceded for them to Iluvatar, and he graciously created, just for them, a species very like children. Small, barefoot, simple, strong children who revere everything the Entwives love, like orchards and gardens and order and peace. This was hinted at when Sam's cousin Hal saw a tree walking on the North Moors. You see, the Antwives are still watching over them. It would also explain the Hobbit's respect for the trees scattered through the Shire, but the animosity for those in the old forest. Mama's boys. One of the recurring topics in a group who love Discworld books is what's your ideal cast for an on-screen version? We all agree that the Watch series is an absolute disaster, so we can ignore that. I was okay with The Color of Magic and Hogfather, with reservations, and some people enjoyed going postal, but I hated it like poison, so let's start there. The ideal cast for going postal. <clears throat> Jack Quaid would make an amazing Moist Von Lipvig. The con artist with the innocent eyes and the sunshine smile, oh yes. I'd give a doorbell to one of our feisty actresses, like Zoe Saldana. I'd get John Noble to be groat if he was willing to dust off his Walter Bishop mannerisms. Here, by the way, are soda cans to remind us that manganese is also used in aluminum alloys specifically for beverage cans because, as you probably guessed, it prevents corrosion by absorbing impurities. Go, manganese! He's got coins dangling in a bunch on his other hip, because coins can contain manganese, just... mostly because it's just a metal. Moving on. Reacher Gilt must be someone who can do charming and larger than life, like Robert Downey Jr., although it would be weird to see him as a villain. 
Lance Reddick is my veterinary since we lost Alan Rickman. Omid Abtahi could be a delightful drum knot. Peter Macon as the voice and physicality of Mr. Pump would be so very powerful. Burn Gorman is always a frigging assassin, but damn it, I still see him as Grile. Stanley could be any skinny young man willing to be a little weird. Pretty much any cast member from SNL could rock Miss McElariot, and Igor is Andy Serkis. Yeah. The current film version left out the new pie, which was stupid, and the smoking new, which was sad. I'd keep him in, but make Alex a woman, because nerd chicks are awesome. Who would you cast? It's all only theoretical, but still. At this point in the painting, I'm trying to make his apron fall a little more naturally. It has black embroidery to call back to the prehistoric pigment, but now I'm thinking I should just have added some cave paintings to the apron, for clarity's sake. And there's no pink on him anywhere, which is a bummer. As is the case with nearly every element, they have so many uses, so many compounds and reactions and magnetic states. Manganese is paramagnetic, by the way. So many things to know, like... I just found out that there's this brilliant blue pigment invented in 2009, which is composed of yttrium, indium, and manganese, or, as I call it, yinmin. How cool is that? I will never be able to fit it all into a painting. Hopefully, though, I'll get enough in to help jog your memory. Thank you so much for watching. I hope it was fun. Until next time, eat ice cream, walk barefoot, Read Pratchett, avoid boring trousers, and stay healthy. I haven't noticed one way or the other lately. I was not paying attention. I turned it on again. Yeah, freezing? Um, I kept hearing noises from the porch that were spooking me. It was just a wind, but I was like, ah, raccoons, ah, axe-wielding maniacs, ah. My fist finally like, fine, I'll just turn on the light. I'll be able to see that it's the wind and not have to just convince myself every two minutes. <laughs>